Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome, panelists. Welcome, our moderator. This is our fourth of Powder River Basin Resource Council's webinar series, Reclaiming and Growing Wyoming's Future. My name is Monica Leininger. I proudly work for Powder River Basin Resource Council as a community organizer, and I'll be helping out with tech today and jumping in if need be. Um, so the goal for these webinar series is to start a deeper ongoing conversation about Wyoming's economy, as well as to provide education, tools, and resources for a planned transition. For those of you that don't know much about the Powder River Basin Resource Council, we are a grassroots agricultural and conservation organization based in Wyoming. Our members are concerned citizens committed to the conservation of our unique resources, including the promotion of responsible energy development. If you want to find out more about us, you can check out our website at powderriverbasin.org. Um, we will have three speakers today. Each of them will speak, and then we'll begin our question and answer session. So now I'm going to welcome our moderator. Welcome Dale Steenbergen, CEO of Greater Cheyenne Chamber and head of the Wyoming Business and Industry Federation will moderate our session today. Dale's experience includes more than 30 years of successful management and experience in chambers of commerce, agro-business operations, and small business. His policy expertise in local, state, and federal advocacy efforts have led to major improvements in policy and increased funding for our local and regional projects. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dale. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you. Uh, what, what a timely topic for where we are at in the world with, uh, in the middle of a pandemic, and certainly we have uh, challenges in the uh, world of figuring out what our approach to the future should be, what our approach to the future of our economy should be, how we manage both the economy and our natural resources and our, and our human resources, I guess all of those, uh, to make sure that our future is strong. And I think we have a, a great panel uh, today to uh, visit about this topic with us. Um, our first speaker will be Ben Alexander, he is responsible for providing coordination, research, strategic direction, and leadership for programs at the Resources Legacy Fund. Before RLF, he served as Chief Program Officer at the LOR Foundation, was co-founder and co-director of Headwaters Economics, and was a director at the Sonoran Institute. Uh, he lives with his family in Bozeman, Montana. Not a bad place to live, Ben, in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, a, a be beautiful spot. So with that, I will turn it over to Ben and then we'll introduce the other speakers uh, as we get them. But please uh, know that we welcome all of our speakers here and we'll let Ben kick it off. Thank you, Dale. I'm going to, uh, so you don't have to look at my mug, I'm going to uh, pull up a slideshow to share with you. And I, I have a relatively modest number of slides in about 20 minutes to share a set of ideas that I hope will uh, get you thinking um, and also stimulate some discussion. So I want to I want to thank the uh, Powder River Basin Resource Council and, and Dale for that kind intro and for hosting uh, the webinar today. And uh, this, as Dale mentioned, this is a really important timely topic, particularly for Wyoming, the most energy focused state in the nation. Um, and facing difficult economic headwinds as a result of that narrow focus. And so as we think about, you know, as we are empathetic in the world now, and as we see the difficulties that many people face, we, we are also thinking about a crisis as a way to re-examine some basic assumptions and in a way, think our way forward. Um, what, what, what kinds of like, basic assumptions about economic development about how we generate and retain, export, capture wealth, could we be re-examining in this moment? Is our economy gonna fundamentally shift um, as a result of the pandemic and this recession? Um, are we looking at an acceleration of longer term trends that we've seen in the West? You know, these are questions that are very paramount in our minds today. And I, I don't wanna, take a lot of time out of my 20 minutes to kind of go through the larger sort of changing economy of the West discussion, but instead to get relatively quickly to some ideas around how to 
think about managing change, benefiting from change, building capacity and leadership to be resilient in the face of change. So with that, I just, you know, I just think it's so important right now to acknowledge that this is a difficult time. It's time for us to think about how we can pull together and help each other. Um, and uh, with this idea of thinking about resilience last year, which I had no idea would be so much more resonant today, uh, I undertook some research looking at the question of what does it take or what are the characteristics of efforts that have endeavored to diversify energy focused economies in the Intermountain West. And I asked uh, an expert panel of academic advisors, including Rob Guyby in Wyoming, who uh, presented earlier in this seminar series, to help me think about how to answer that question and to review the ideas uh, that um, I developed through the process of that research. So I'll get very quickly to what I found, but um, I just want to set the stage for a minute and talk about kind of some of the economic context we're in. And I, I, Monica and Michelle asked me to do that briefly. But we know that in our Western economy, we've been looking at some long-term trends, things like globalization, automation, industry maturity, competition from the developing countries, uh, the development of a modern services economy and information economies, the delocalization, uh, or location neutral aspects of the most productive components of our uh, industry segments in the nation today have all fundamentally shifted the geography of our economy and opportunities for local places and businesses to compete in the national and international economy. So with that, that we can see that there are um, places that are doing well in this changed competitive environment and places that are struggling. And unfortunately, many rural places are really struggling to adapt, in part because we face fierce competition now um, from abroad and uh, lower cost competition than we ever have for some of our natural resource sectors. Even though those markets have grown and they've become more efficient and productive, um, we simply aren't able to employ as many people in those jobs. And that's led to many challenges for rural places to trying to sustain employment, retain youth, um, and sustain a standard of living that many of us have become accustomed to. The broader context, of course, is that we've been developing a services economy that requires a different set of competitive uh, ingredients to succeed. And it has a real mix of high paying and low paying jobs, um, rewarding generally sort of the urban components of the higher knowledge aspects of that services economy and punishing, if you will, some of the lower skill aspects of the service delivery economy that uh, are not as higher margin, um, but are still required and in many cases are replacing some of our higher paying natural resource sector jobs. And it's led to real challenge and stress in rural America and in the rural West and in Wyoming. And I, I want to say that these are general trends, but I want to acknowledge that not all places are alike. Uh, we have large metropolitan areas, small micropolitan areas. We have rural places that are well connected to metropolitan markets. And we have truly very small rural and isolated places, each of which occupy a distinct economic geography. And so there's likely not one size fits all answer to the question of how you revitalize and rebuild economies in an economic transition moment. But we should be thinking about what type of place we are in and what our challenges are as we think about the strategies that will make sense for many places in some places and individual places in others. So um, with that, I wanna jump to this. Oh, I probably should have been showing you this graphic uh, all along. Um, you know, the basic idea that our non-services have become so efficient, they're not creating a lot of new employment and personal income and that our services and non-labor income, which is combination of government transfer payments and retirement income from investments or investment income writ large, that these are becoming the dominant drivers of our larger economy. So with this research, you know, the first thing that we set out to do, and it's really, really important for Wyoming, is to think about, well, what is an energy focused economy? And we ended up looking at the 200 plus counties in the Intermountain West states and saying, if between 1980 and 2016, you had above average earnings in oil and gas and coal and coal related industries that we called you for the purposes of our study, 
energy focused. And there were 38 coal counties and 32 oil and gas counties and a significant overlap between those two distinct sets of counties. This is a, a data visualization that I built with the help of Headwaters Economics to be able to think about the location of that geography and then also to be able to, using the slider bars up top, to be able to sort of find where you had your really focused energy economies or to begin to think about where you see in the upper right here service sector growth um, as a proxy for thinking about where you might find industry diversification. Um, there's more here and after the webinar I can share this web link with folks who want to explore that information resource. So when we think about, um, actually I want to backtrack, I apologize. There are some core concepts here that I think it's helpful to have. Um, Rob got me talked about it a little bit in his remarks a few weeks ago. But the first is this idea of economic development. We, we talk about it all the time. And I just want to be clear what, we, what I mean when I use that term. And I, looking at the literature, it's very clear that it's both an outcome and a process. The outcome side of it is the creation of jobs and wealth and the improvement of quality of life. The process side of it is a process that influences growth and restructures the economy to enhance economic well-being. And I, I really think it's the process side of it that we're more interested in today. What is resilience? I mean, this is this key topic that kind of undergirded my interest in sort of more successful economies over time. It struck me as being more resilient, not necessarily being faster growing or generating more wealth, but being more resilient and perhaps equitable. The essence of resilience is to absorb impacts and reorganize based on a new understanding of competitive positioning. It's not trying to keep a place or an economy the way it is in the face of change or even trying to control change. It's really about shifting attention and resources to cope with and adapt to change. And if we can keep a focus on resilience as we think about economic transitions, I think we'll be well served. Lastly, diversification. This is a kind of a key concept in the research and a way of thinking about how you actually would measure whether an economic transition has happened. So I defined economic diversification as a shift from a single source to multiple sources of jobs and income covering large segments of the population. And it turns out it's a pretty good proxy for um, the results side of resilience, not so much the process side. So when we started out, we, we kind of had some hypotheses about well, how might success, what, what, what's the list of successful economic development approaches look like? And um, we started listing them, reading the literature, you know, asking the academics what they, what they see out there, talking to economic development professionals, probably many like on the call today. And you can see there's a whole range of approaches. You know, some focus on you know, growing from within, and entrepreneurs and incubators and economic gardening type approaches. Others really look at recruiting new businesses, focusing on industry cluster strengths, traded sector uh, industries that pay better, uh, for example. Um, so if you, you know, this list could be larger and more comprehensive. I, I, I share it with you today with the idea that I could not find a consistent set of lessons as I looked around at communities on the ground who were trying to navigate economic transitions to say, yep, uh, you should all focus on recruiting businesses, or yep, you should all focus on encouraging entrepreneurship, and that is the silver bullet. In fact, I think there is no silver bullet, and in part because places around the West and around the country and around the world are different, uh, face different challenges, have different assets and market opportunities, and so one approach does not make sense. And yet, I might be helpful for all of you today on the webinar to think about the range of approaches that are out there. Secondly, we thought, well, let's have a basic approach, not a specific tactic, such as reducing vulnerabilities that have been identified in an economy or focus on creating stability, which you hear a lot about, or focusing on growth and growth sectors, or an emphasis on emerging sectors uh, that have promised down the road. And again, I have to say that we couldn't find a consistent set of uh, results that showed that one of those approaches, more, more generalized approaches, was the key to success around economic transitions. So, you know, it kind of stumped us there for a minute. And it, it really just kicked me back to a couple of fundamental things. 
what is the nature of change that we're trying to navigate or create a transition around? And do we have a strategy to navigate that change? And as I started to read comprehensive economic development strategies from around the West and talk to professionals, I realized that um, the response to change is really fundamentally different in different places. And whether there's a strategy and what that strategy is, is very different place to place. So let's talk about those things just briefly for a minute. On this idea of response to change, and the reason I have an image of Janus, the, 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 the Greek god uh, on the screen today is that in the West, maybe everywhere, but in the West, we know that economics and culture are closely tied, that our identities and our occupations are closely aligned. And so our response to economic change when one industry is under threat is often very personal, and we fight to keep that industry and that identity alive. And that's one entirely legitimate response to change. It may not be the most adaptive and resilient response to change, however. And more successful places over time don't focus on trying to keep places the way it is or even to control change so much as to figure out how they can benefit from it and create capacities that can reinvest um, and create new strategies that benefit within a context of change. So the response to change is fundamentally critical. And that puts a premium on leadership and, and the capacities or strengths of partnerships around leadership to activate discussions and initiatives to realize change. Secondly, on this competitive strategy, you'll see a lot of discussion around vision, uh, which is really important. You'll see a lot of discussion around um, sort of lists of things, strengths, weaknesses, assets, you know, uh, the rest of it. And those are good uh, exercises to sort of get the lay of the land, but none of that is a replacement for a strategy. And I really borrow from Michael Porter and, and others who have subsequently sort of built on the distinction between comparative advantage and competitive advantage. But there's just sort of two things I want you to think about with strategy. The first is what I'll call where to play. And the second is how to win. And the where to play thing is really typically overlooked. It's about where to compete and what business you're in. It can be about the geography, product or service, customer segment, distribution channel, but it's fundamentally, are you competing in a business where you can succeed and where you have some strengths? But how to win, which people typically jump to right away and is really hard to get right, is do you have a low cost strategy to succeed or do you have a differentiation strategy to succeed? The low cost approach is really can we produce a good or services for less than everybody else? There's no real reward for being second position here. And we've had that in Wyoming around our energy resources for a long time. We've been low cost producer of high value natural resources. And we've produced that by capturing that value and shipping it in large quantities to markets around the world. If we cannot be that low cost producer, or if there are other barriers to capturing that value in a low cost manner, uh, we have to think about other strategies and other industries. The other strategy, and the, the, the beauty is this thing is really simple. There's only two strategies, low cost or differentiation. And on differentiation, you're really trying to think about less on the supply side and more on the demand side. Who am I selling a product or service to? Are there barriers to entry from others who might compete with me in providing that service or product? Does the customer uh, is the customer discerning and have an ability to pay for the product? And questions like that. So if we can figure out the right industry to be in, and then we can figure out how to compete and being clear that we're either on a cost track or a differentiation track, then we can succeed. So those two things, response to change and competitive strategy, I think are just really fundamental to success. And as I started to read the resilience and economic development literature and started to talk to people on the ground, I had developed, a, you know, perish the thought, but I developed a, a theory of change, which, which I want to walk you through right now, because um, I really think it's the foundation for how to think about uh, benefiting from economic distress and creating successful transitions. So the key, as you can imagine, is it starts with this idea of rupture. And this is, this is really fundamental, because some 
we think about an agricultural context where we've seen a sort of a, a slow a slow motion train wreck in a lot of ways around um, sort of rural agriculture in America and the ability to support family farms and create healthy food and um, all the rest of it that we it's hard to address because it's moving slowly and it's happening all the time but it's not ever happening in one moment contrast that with the closure of a coal mine and the loss of 75 percent of the employment base in a community we know in that context that we are going to have focus that we are going to have difficult and disciplined conversations about what to do next that there are going to be people asking what resources do you need um, what does the next step look like it has to be different than what we had in the past um, and so that nature of that rupture is really fundamental and some of the, some types of rupture are easier to organize around than others as I sort of hinted, I think leadership is one of the key ingredients here. It is leadership take the rupture and use it as uh, an opportunity to double down on the past um, or to do that exclusively, or does it begin to think about how to lead in a more productive sense, um, how to explore new options, how to communicate with parties in the community and outside the community around what else might work for the community employment, uh, the labor force in the community, the skills and how they might need to evolve and all the rest of it. Vision. So we end up thinking about the past or our current identities unless we actually explicitly go through the exercise of thinking about where we're headed in new ways. And ideally a community as a whole crafts, crafts a vision, um, although it can be led by a particularly energized part of a community, uh, business community, landowners, uh, the civic sectors uh, and just private individuals um, but the vision should generally express a desired future and begin to roadmap how to get there and then we have the disciplined discussion about our strategy where to play how to win and then we have a conversation because all transition efforts require human and financial resources and these are crucial to initiating change convening planning strategy development exercises, take resources, building new competitive advantage around, again, training infrastructure, branding, marketing, for example, take resources, sustaining momentum, you know, building investor and customer relationships, scaling startups, these things take resources, and as well as starting new ventures. So over time, I think you'll see that the mix of resources will change. And they might even rely initially on more outside resources to support a local effort, but over time they should become more driven by local competencies, uh, human capital, and financial resources. And then finally, this execution piece is so important because economic development is a long-term effort. It is it's not <laughs> on the news cycle or the social media cycle or even on the political cycle. It's a decade-long cycle. And so it takes discipline. So if we have the leadership vision, strategy, and resources, we set the stage for effective action, which involves coordination, the discipline to adhere to our choice commitments, the dedication to seeing things through to completion. And then likely, we're facing additional ruptures and we're going back through the cycle and re-examining our assumptions, rethinking our investment priorities, uh, and going back to disciplined execution. It's not uncommon to see places doing trying to do too many things at once, the do everything strategy, and particularly in a rural context where we don't have a lot of capacity, it doesn't serve us well. We need to focus in on winning strategies with the limited resources we have and balance that defending past advantage with creating new advantages in the process. So that's my, my theory of change. And I, I'm at time, but I, I maybe in the Q&A we can go into some of the examples, but I, you know, I, I think this stuff becomes real and takes form and you can kind of touch and feel it more when we think about how it works on the ground and how it gets complicated at times, but it's really the human stories of the leadership that carry you through and you realize what it takes at the end of the day to make this work. And I, I just want to read you one quote and we can come back to any of these details from the uh, case studies that I was going to take time to visit with you a little more about. But there's a quote from a banker down in Colorado who was very involved in the closure of some of the significant coal mines on the North Fork. And he said, Ben, to create change, you need influential people who know how to navigate the scene, 
on the private side and to get public influence, to walk forward together, craft a vision, then focus and work, and broaden the group for legitimacy and build partnerships to bring in resources and expertise and let time and effort work for you. Thank you, Ben. Um, appreciate those comments. Um, I think what a nice overview of, of where we are, and certainly we face some significant challenges in rural and energy communities as a kid who grew up on a ranch in the far northwest corner of Oklahoma, and oil field and cattle were our only things to rely on. Um, I certainly felt a lot of your presentation as you were talking about some of those challenges. Looking forward to our, our next presenter, uh, Cindy Winland, uh, who provides consulting service, services to the Just Transition Fund, focusing on technical assistance and planning in communities impacted by the transition away from coal assets. Cindy's work is primarily in power plant communities in the Midwest and Western states, as well as in tribal communities. She develops strategies to address the financial, employment, social, and environmental impacts when a power plant closes. She works closely with utilities on public engagement and site reuse as part of the clo closure process. Cindy's gonna be talking a little bit about the funding and technical services that the Just Transition Fund offers to communities and NGOs who are working on transitioning their community when coal plants and mines close. Uh, Cindy, this is a particular interest to me as an economic developer. We are always looking for those um, on the ground, boots on the ground kinds of solutions. So look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks very much. I really appreciate being part of the webinar uh, and thanks for the introduction, Dale. Uh, I also uh, was really thinking I love Ben's uh, discussion uh, because it really helps set the stage for the kinds of ways that we uh, hope to implement some of your new theory of change, Ben. So thanks very much. In fact, I might have to I might have to quote some of that as we go through it because it was just the perfect setup for this. So, so uh, uh, I'm with the uh, Just Transition Fund, and um, the fund works to build uh, resilient communities by advancing economic solutions that are equitable, inclusive, and low carbon. The fund is roughly five years old. Uh, and you can see here that um, we, as uh, uh, Ben spoke of, we work in communities that uh, advance some strategies that have been proven to be successful. Um, and we focus on those strategies. And however, those are all driven by the vision that's local. So um, for us, we want to strengthen and diversify economies. Pretty obviously, we'd like to uh, build resilience of workers and, and uh, for the new economy, for sure, and to promote systems change and to be able to scale some of those successful things and show them to other areas and why those are successful and may or may not in pieces and parts work for them. So one of the most important things to point out is that we are a hybrid. So we operate as both a funding organization, a typical philanthropy, but also as a technical assistance organization. And so uh, we work uh, in that way as a nonprofit. I lead the technical assistance program for the fund. And in technical assistance, we work in communities. So we're physically there when we can be, uh, not recently. Um, but we target our investments in the economically hardest hit, and we have a, a system for how we've chosen that, and we'll show uh, in a little bit the states where we work. We try and work with the most vulnerable populations because um, as we've all heard from Rob and everybody in the previous um, webinars that uh, when there's a small economy or economy that's dependent on fossil fuels and there's a closure or a shutdown or some other kind of contraction, a community that's doing well can, can pretty quickly become a vulnerable population. So we think it's really important that the solutions are built from the ground up. And that's because if, if there isn't a vision locally and there isn't a group of people, the leadership uh, that is willing to stand by these, this vision and to execute it, then it, there is no sustainability in the, in the change, which can take a very long time. And of course, to do this, we work with a wide range of partners. <laughs> 
So we've learned a few things. Um, we've learned uh, that, and these, you know, you'd say, well, that's not, that's not terribly uh, new, but it, you'd think so. Early planning uh, really does foster a better long-term income. And so it's important to know where to start and to start early. And that one of the things we encounter is that a lot of communities are afraid to say it out loud as though that's going to cause the plant to close or the mine to close, but to recognize this is going to be in our future and we need to think about it. We want to bring some diverse resources. And again, we want the, the solutions to be locally driven, uh, but those resources are based on the kinds of needs that the community identifies. And it won't be the same in every place. Some of those resources may be financial. Some of those resources may be expertise. Some of them may be our, our actual work on the ground like facilitation. And we'll show some examples of that work in the future. Some of it may be helping to, to plan testimony at a meeting or to uh, help uh, write a grant or a variety of things. Um, and then when we talk about locally derived solutions are the most likely to succeed, when we work with a community, we want to be sure we're not swooping in with a solution and saying, this is the way to do it, cookie cutter, drop it down. Our job is to try and help that community uh, figure out what it is that they really need. Um, and, you know, Ben gave us some great economic thinking that there's a variety of solutions and they often fall into two buckets. One might be a uh, low cost producer kind of thing. And that's to, for us, that looks like when people say, oh, we've got this power plant and this source of of distribution of power and we've got this big industrial setting, we're gonna have something else come in and that's gonna be our savior. That's a very common way to approach it. Versus the diversification and differentiation, which takes a much longer time and a much more uh, strategic approach and different kinds of tactics. So we wanna help you identify those kinds of things and figure out how best to implement them. And then of course, what kinds of resources you need to do that. So what do we do? Well, we work to help start the transition planning process. Um, we've developed some tools that are available free and they're on our website, which we talk about in a little bit. We want to also help you connect with other communities that have had similar issues because there's it's it's really helpful to talk to other humans who have dealt with this. Where have we hit bumps in the road? What are similar challenges? What are different challenges? What worked? What didn't? Another really important thing that we do is to identify funding sources. So it's not just the money that we can provide, and we're often the first in, uh, we, and we often leverage uh, other things, primarily federal funds, but we may also leverage some other kinds of funding, but also to bring other potential funders. And it may be local foundations, it may be national foundations, it could be the utility is often interested in contributing, it could be some in-kind contributions, so, and it's not just bringing the money, it's bringing the, the relationships with the federal funding agencies and helping with those discussions. And in, if in certain cases, when we think it'll be successful, we can help you with grant writing. We do a lot of outreach. And when we talk about affected stakeholders, often our outreach is to the people who disagree. And because we think that successful solutions require that there's uh, some um, consensus of thought about how to go forward, even if there's disagreement on people's policies and some of the other things they might think about and how they thought about how we got to this point and what we're going to do. But if we aren't all in the room and working toward it, it's much less likely to succeed. And again, this sounds like a Miss America statement, but really it's really important. Just like the leadership is important, we call them the community champions. Um, if you don't have those and you don't have enough people the the core group that's moving forward is much more difficult. And then finally, sharing information and resources. Nothing should be a secret. Nothing should be proprietary. What If we've developed something we think is useful, we want to share it. If we've seen it in another community, we want to share it. If we know there's expertise out there, we would like to bring it to you if we think that it would be, and you think it would be helpful. So here's a map of where we work. We have. Um, we have the shading, uh, the dark shading is showing where we provide funding. Um, and the lighter uh, states are in some places are considered what we call our watch states. Um, this map needs to be updated. We have a few more areas now that we're including in, the, in this um, effort. And our technical assistance 
uh, doesn't necessarily follow or precede our funding. Sometimes technical assistance happens separately from that. Sometimes it happens um, in conjunction with that. And uh, often funding can follow once a program or an implementation uh, strategy has been identified. And here's just a list of some of the partners. We work extensively with community-based nonprofits. We also work with governmental units, with municipalities, regional economic development kinds of folks, local foundations, and then the whole uh, slew of workforce and community economic development kinds of, of typical things that you might see. So what does the process look like? Well, first off, we, as Ben mentioned, and we hear a lot, Success is learning how to benefit from the change. You know, uh, other people like my grandma might have said, well, it's all depending on how you look at it. Well, so it's not that simple, but you do have to look at it and say change is happening and, and acceptance is very important. And so what, what kinds of things can we do? Well, first we need to connect. We wanna learn your community context. We wanna understand the stage of transition because that will help us bring the right resources and know where to start with you. And then the vision, the goals for the future. So a vision can often be a statement and the goals can often be the ways to achieve that statement. And of course, then we get into the strategies and the tactics. So those are the kinds of things we might wanna look at, but it, then we wanna align some things. What happens now? What is most important? Because things happen either concurrently or you know, consecutively. And I often call it a crooked path. Some things are successful, some things take longer than we think, some things are, are uh, pinballing off the walls. So it's important for us to really try in our strategy with the community is to really try and identify what those things are and what is most important to start with. What's the limiting reagent? If we don't do this what, and we don't have enough of that, we can't do any of these other things. And then some timelines and milestones recognizing that these don't always fall into place, but it's important to have a goal and a goal with a timeline. And if you're dealing in federal funding, you'll all know that there's a timeline for sure. And those of you writing federal grants right now are probably scrambling toward the end of that as the fiscal year comes to a close pretty soon. And then we really want uh, sustained action. So we fund things like uh, workforce development programs that are very specific to a, to a skill, or they may be more broad to um, a, a wraparound kind of program that teaches both the skill and the um, social skills and the financial skills and some of the other things that might be necessary to be successful in the future. And we we fund all kinds of other things uh, also, but this ACT portion is really important because that's where we're making the actual change on the ground and that people can see. So what kind of resources do we have? Uh, just recently, we, re we released a, we, what we call a blueprint, which is pretty much a here's how to do it, um, where you start, what are some of the policies that are involved in other places that might impact you, who should be involved, who's, who can be your community leadership, where to find help. Um, we talk a lot about the stages of transition. Did it happen a long time ago, five years maybe? Uh, in terms of, say, a plant closure, or are we looking at this in the future, and how does that impact what we need? Again, supporting workforce strategies were really important uh, and very focused on that. And then, of course, the finding funding. And things are, are, are being released on our website pretty regularly, so if you are able to check into that periodically, you'll see all kinds of things, in addition to our um, grant solicitations twice a year. Um, so let's look at a couple examples real quickly here. Um, while we have a few minutes, Coal Strip, Montana, uh, closest community in to Wyoming where we've worked. And I have spent the better part of two years, I think, working in Coal Strip and with uh, the surrounding indigenous communities. Coal Strip, as you probably know, is a mine mouth community, very much a company town. Um, twice built as a coal uh, focus in order to provide energy independence to the US during the uh, energy crisis in the 70s. It's very isolated, uh, about two hours southeast of build buildings. Uh, half the plants, two of the units have closed, the other two are uh, have an unknown future. 
And a, a unique thing has happened in Coal Strip, and that is that um, with the departure of, of Puget Sound Energy from the first two coal units, there was a $10 million settlement given to the community, which was uh, as yet undefined, to spend to address this transition. And there were a few more parameters and not many. And so, and then the settlement was negotiated with uh, the state of Montana and the state of Washington, uh, as opposed to the community of Coal Strip. So the state uh, established an advisory committee to try and get some basic guiding principles and how are we gonna use this money and asked us at the, at the fund to come in and help facilitate that discussion make sure that we heard from the impacted parties, make sure that the testimony was taken in a way that uh, reflected the, the magnitude of the impact in each of the different groups. And so we are seeing here a picture of uh, Coal Strip at the initial construction on the left, one of the community meetings we held in the middle, and uh, the original company town on the right. Um, that was 1987. So again, our, our work was on the ground facilitation. Our, our purpose was to provide some subject expertise to promote inclusion and ensure inclusion to make sure that the community was heard which was a difficult process in the beginning to make sure that 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 actually happened and so we took the community community meetings to the impacted um, geography and the outcomes were a plan for the uh, expenditure of the funds uh, a fiduciary to hold those funds which established the coal strip impact foundation uh, an action plan and um, some outgrowths from that are some potential collaborations uh, on some workforce development programs that will be led by the, the Crow and Northern Cheyenne tribal communities. Um, and some other uh, identification of uh, sources of funding for the area and um, how, to, how to think about their new future, which will include and already has started to include a pretty substantial contraction in terms of population, housing, school enrollment, um, certainly uh, local revenues and um, a, a push uh, that is going on in the community to uh, use some of the local labor um, potentially at, at union wages or within the union to do the remediation and cleanup to help stabilize the community by keeping people there as well as uh, give those folks a chance to find other work while they're working on a, a probably what is going to be a long-term uh, cleanup project of coal ash. Um, the next example is Tonawanda, New York. Tonawanda is a suburb of Buffalo, and uh, we, uh, we played a very different role in Tonawanda. Um, the fund has been supporting them for uh, and supporting the uh, Clean Air Coalition, actually, in Tonawanda for several years. And the role of the Clean Air Coalition was to um, really be the impetus behind New York State creating a fund that would, and it's the first ever uh, tax-based replacement legislation that provides uh, funding to a municipality to backfill the loss of the taxes over the course of seven years in decreasing amounts. So that's the classic definition of a glide path. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, we've, I have discussions all the time about whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, but in New York, this is the one thing that they have done to address transition. It's the process that was getting to that point where they produced a plan called Tonawanda Tomorrow, and the plan is focused on industrial redevelopment in their industrial corridor when their coal plant, the Huntley plant, closed. Um, and there's a long story going up to it, but the big, the big um, win in the middle of all of this is that the collaboration that we talked about, the leadership was played by Clean Air Coalition. The collaboration included some unlikely partners with Clean Air, like the teachers union and the governmental unions and the IBEW and AFL-CIO, who normally would say, we, you know, we're gonna lose jobs if this happens, but they knew they were, this plant was going to close. And so the issue was, now let's move forward. And they were able to, to create um, a really strong coalition and pass this legislation. And our, our role in this has been all kinds of things, not only funder, but uh, peacemaker third party in a lot of cases when they would come to an impasse in the plan or with the groups talking, we were often called in 
uh, to help the discussion happen, to help people concentrate on what we needed to do uh, to move forward as opposed to things that might have happened in the past or worries about the future. So I spent a lot of time there. Um, we also worked as a catalyst. And in that way, we brought this in project to, along with others for sure, um, but to get some national attention, to get some additional national funding and to really serve as a as an example and a template for a lot of different uh, ways, both states looking at mitigation funding funds, as well as organizations who are trying to plan with the community, as well as labor about how you can work together with other labor groups and as well as with uh, who might be, uh, you know, an environmental group that may or may not uh, see eye to eye. So that's been a really interesting, a really interesting project and a pretty amazing outcome. The actual author of the plan was uh, the State University of New York, some planners on their um, uh, faculty. And, and so we had uh, the whole, <laughs> we had labor on one side, we had the environmental groups on the other side, we had academia over here, and then we had philanthropy kind of in the middle trying to make uh, some of these pieces and parts work. So that was a really interesting one. And then, um, let's see here quickly, Carbondale, Illinois, where we essentially uh, helped um, jumpstart a local nonprofit, uh, which uh, to start the discussion among communities and, and groups, um, called, it's called the climate economy, about what happens when coal in Southern Illinois leaves. And, you know, they'll always say they're gonna be the last man standing and, um, maybe kind of sim similar to Wyoming, but the discussion hadn't even started. And so this was an opportunity to really get a group going that was able to provide education and collaboration. And they're doing great. This is there in year three. And then finally, a little bit about the uh, Coalition of Utility Cities in Minnesota, because this is a totally different kind of work where we uh, worked on an impact analysis with this coalition of seven communities that host base load power plants, as well as an environmental nonprofit to quantify uh, the amount of financial impact that will happen when these uh, power plants close, as well as to look at the uh, qualitative changes in life. And so they uh, were able to take that to the Minnesota State Legislature and get a fund established, the, the Just Transition Fund established very minor at this point at $2 million, but it's a start and a recognition that these communities are gonna need some assistance, undefined as of yet. The one of the most important things though, is that this impact analysis also can um, stand as a template for other communities, other states, because the, the uh, work was done with a uh, committee that included the utilities, as well as the cities, as well as the environmental organizations, as well as the lobbyists. And so when we get to the end of the study, uh, the objective is that everybody agrees on this quantitative um, output that we're going to see and then take to the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, uh, where there has to be proof, you have to quantify what the impact is gonna be, you have to show there's been community input. And with this study, they were able to go to the Minnesota PUC and say, we all agree, nobody's gonna intervene on whether we got our demographics wrong or we looked at the wrong kind of impacts. And that's huge if you've ever um, you know, worked through an IRP, an integrated resource plan. So that is, uh, those are some uh, examples of the kind of work we do and the way that we focus our efforts and our philosophy, our theory of change. Um, and I'm uh, glad to answer questions during our question and answer time. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Cindy. And thank you for sharing those very meaningful stories with us on some of the success that uh, your organization has had. I think it provides us a good, uh, helps us with our roadmap forward as we work to do the same kinds of things in the state of Wyoming. Our next speaker is uh, Chris Markison, and he is the Director of Colorado and State Economic Transition Policy for the Blue Green Alliance. He is known as an innovator in economic and community development, as well as public policy. His forward thinking leadership is grounded in principles of community collaboration, sustainability, and human-centered economic development that cultivates healthy community and land use practices. 
Through his work, Pueblo County is now recognized as a national policy leader in the cannabis industry and as an emerging international leader in the renewable industry sector. In his presentation, Colorado's statewide just transition, defining a structure, strategy, and path forward, Chris will talk about the Colorado, Colorado's Office of Just Transition and its plan to pre, be presented on August 1st as two state agencies. I was especially interested in your human-centered economic development, Chris, as I think this is, we often across this country forget the human piece of what we are doing and how those numbers impact humans at all levels. So welcome and we look forward to your comments. Thanks, Dale. I appreciate the introduction and uh, thanks to the Powder River Basin Resource Council for hosting this webinar. Uh, this is really a, a fantastic uh, a, a thing for, for Wyoming. Um, also, th it's a pleasure to be presenting with Ben and Cindy. Um, like Dale said, I'll discuss uh, Colorado's effort to, to form a state just transition office uh, and draft a, state, a statewide just transition plan. A little about the Blue Green Alliance. Uh, we unite America's lage, uh, largest labor unions and its most influential environmental organizations uh, to solve today's environmental challenges in ways that create and sustain uh, and, and maintain quality jobs and build a stronger, fairer economy. Uh, so today I'll, I'll, I'll loop, talk about five main topics here, uh, the need for transition in Colorado, the landscape surrounding that change, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, legislation. Uh, I'll spend the majority of my time on Colorado's draft plan and uh, touch on the ongoing role of, of our organization. Um, as in, in Wyoming, as Ben noted, there are a variety of factors influencing Colorado's coal markets. Uh, innovations in natural gas development and renewables have significantly driven prices of energy below the cost of coal-fired generation. Uh, likewise, utilities are responding to a strong demand for renewable generation by their investors and their consumers. Uh, they also see an overall reduction in system-wide energy consumption and stricter mandates on greenhouse gas pollution. Uh, responding to these factors, Colorado utilities have revised their business models. Uh, investments in smart grid technology, renewables infrastructure, and gas power plants uh, are, are making coal a, a, less of, a less attractive fuel choice. Um, one major factor driving the transition timeline in Colorado is mandates from the state legislature. Firm greenhouse gas emissions targets were set in 2019, uh, which clarified expected timelines of coal power plant closures. 50% of the state's greenhouse gas reduction goals will be achieved by closure of coal power plants. Uh, this action is by far the least expensive, shortest term option available to meet the targets. Uh, so what does this mean to Colorado coal communities? Well, numerous studies, including some from Headwaters Economics, uh, note that several of uh, Colorado's regional economies are heavily dependent on coal. Uh, jobs at coal power plants and coal mines pay family sustaining wages. Uh, equivalent wage jobs in other industry simply doesn't exist in many of Colorado's coal communities. The spin-off effect of coal closures will have a dramatic effect on both the supply chain industry and Main Street businesses. Uh, estimates project Colorado will lose over 2,000 jobs in our rural coal communities. Uh, for many of those communities to survive, especially following the global pandemic, uh, a transition plan uh, is, is needed. Uh, so multiple communities across, across Colorado will be impacted by closure of coal facilities. Several coal power plants have already closed, uh, shown here in red. Uh, the power plants in yellow have retirements uh, uh, upcoming. By 2030, uh, Colorado expects only uh, three remaining facilities uh, to remain open. Uh, beyond 2030, Xcel Energy's Coal power plants in Hayden and Brush are expected to re be retired by 2041. Uh, two of the three units uh, at the a coal plant in Pueblo at Comanche uh, will be decommissioned prior to 2030. And the third unit, uh, Comanche 3, is the, the newest coal power plant in the state. It was built in 2010. 
uh, it's likely to remain op operational for a longer period of time, although that time frame uh, is unknown. Just as an aside, uh, Comanche 3 burns Powder River Basin coal. Um, our, in, our labor and environmental partners recognized in this uh, understanding of, the, of Colorado's landscape that um, the need was there to prepare workers and communities for this pending shift. Assembling experts from across the state and across the nation, a set of general assumed conditions in Colorado was identified. These include, um, in general, Coloradoans, including in coal communities, strongly believe that a top priority for the state is to protect clean air and clean water. Additionally, workers noted that if they could, if they would be losing their job, uh, they should, should be protected and compensated somehow. Uh, a top priority for workers is also retraining, supporting their ability to continue to work at the same or higher wage with benefits and retirement security. Uh, the shifting timeline for expected coal, pa coal power plant closures uh, highlighted the urgency of laying out a pathway for a transition, ideally as far in advance as possible. Uh, it was recognized that neither coal communities or the state on their own uh, could effectively transition, um, uh, provide transition options. So broad cooperation between regions and multiple state agencies will be necessary. Um, because coal industry on the previous slide, you, as you can see, affects all corners of Colorado's economy, uh, advocates recognized that a statewide transition effort was necessary. Um, however, because each community is different in many different ways, uh, and closures are set to occur over a relatively long period of time, uh, creating a long-term statewide su uh, support system uh, for coal communities seemed like uh, the best option. Um, of course, along the way, challenges were expected. Communities, workers, advocates um, highlighted a number of issues that Colorado has attempted to address in its plan. Um, first, many Coloradoans challenge the need for transition because they don't believe in the science of climate change. Uh, others noted uh, that some of our county, uh, so some other countries like China and India uh, aren't addressing greenhouse gases to the same degree that rural Colorado was being expected to do. Uh, still others made arguments about appropriate uses of taxpayer dollars or utility dollars. Uh, there were partisan politics in this and a variety of competing interests. Um, however, as I, noted, as I noted previously, the factors driving transition away from coal are much broader than greenhouse gas reductions, affect all Coloradoans, and really do transcend partisan politics. Um, some Colorado, Coloradoans expressed that supporting rural community transition isn't necessary um, because those communities should have seen it coming. Uh, or that it's important enough of an issue to sacrifice a few jobs to save the entire planet. Um, however, the statewide effect on families, uh, communities, and regional economies uh, will just be way too great to ignore. Uh, entire regional identities are at risk in this transition. Um, and as Coloradoans, we feel like our values demonstrate that we should support each other and address problems uh, proactively. Uh, so advocates for just transition also recognize that significant academic research and theories on just transition have been developed over the years, um, but many of these theories remain unproven. Um, the world has kind of demonstrated a relatively poor uh, a reputation of managing transitions in the past, uh, and eyes tend to primarily fix on fixate on economics. Uh, so Colorado Just Transition advocates and, and national experts recognize that if the focus is purely on economics, the temptation will be simply to replace coal with another extractive industry. And Colorado coal communities will someday again be subject to that industry's market fluctuations. Um, therefore, advocates agreed that emphasizing supporting workers and communities was the highest priority and that a holistic approach to economic diversification was required. Uh, so Colorado legislature uh, came uh, uh, with our, our environmental advocates and labor, uh, came together and drafted a House Bill 19-1314. Uh, 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 this bill created the nation's first state just transition office within the State Department of Labor and Employment. Um, 
and an advisory committee was also formed by the legislation comprised of 19 members from multiple areas of expertise um, and uh, members of that committee were appointed by the governor. Uh, a, a key task of this office is to identify which communities will be affected by coal closure, um, when the, those effects will be expected, and then what existing resources within the state are available to assist the communities. Um, the committee and staff were also tasked with, with developing uh, a statewide just transition plan and a series of recommendations to be considered and implemented by the Department of Labor, the Department of Local Affairs, uh, the State Office of Economic Development, uh, the governor and the legislature. Um, the, as, as Dale said, the draft plan will be released on August 1st. Uh, and the final plan, which will include very specific legislative recommendations and state department suggestions uh, for implementation of, plan, of the plan is due on December 31st. Um, so to tackle the tasks outlined in the legislation, the committee created a four separate subcommittees. Each subcommittee brought in additional experts from across the state, uh, including from coal communities to inform their recommendations. Uh, many national experts were also consulted and the Just Transition Fund's work uh, was very helpful in this regard. Um, successful uh, transition precedents from around the globe were studied and in, including uh, the ones that Cindy presented, uh, and a broad array of academic research was considered and debated uh, by the subcommittees. Um, a, a special emphasis on addressing the complex race, class, uh, and environmental issues that are endemic to rural single industry regional economies uh, was also made in the process. Um, so the, through the subcommittee process, five core plan elements uh, were highlighted. Um, as Cindy noted, Cindy noted, the committees recognized that transition must be driven by local communities from the bottom up. Success is fully dependent upon coal communities driving their own transition efforts. However, members recognize that this is sometimes easier said than done. Rural communities simply don't have the kinds of resources needed to plan for the future and manage a, complica a complicated transition. Uh, therefore, the, this plan will recommend uh, making state investments in local resources, empowering individuals within the community to lead the transition and shoring up the revenue losses that are expected. Uh, second, uh, committee members also noted the importance of providing bridges for workers. Um, every worker should be, be presented with a range of choices from early retirement, uh, retraining for another job in the community at the same or better wage, uh, taking a lower wage job, uh, somewhere and receiving a wage, differ a wage differential benefit um, or potentially accepting relocation assistance to get a good job somewhere else. Uh, third, long-term wide-ranging economic development was emphasized as a critical component of the transition plan, um, providing adequate resources to rural development hubs, which is a term that the Aspen Institute, one of our partners in this project, um, is, is featured prominently uh, in the study. Uh, investing in existing businesses and communities and working to help them expand into new markets, hire new workers and expand profits uh, is a key recommendation. Um, uh, investing in local entrepreneurialism through business incubation, business accelerators, shared workspaces, those kinds of things is also mentioned. Um, shifting state resource allocation to prioritize transition communities uh, for business attraction is another recommendation. Uh, and definitely uh, deliberately choosing to only focus on development of high road jobs that lift workers up uh, is a key recommendation. This includes ensuring workers have the ability to collectively bargain for defined health care and, and retirement benefits uh, and earn a family sustaining wage. The committee emphasized that economic development must prioritize job quality over job uh, quantity. The fourth plan element shown here uh, emphasizes the need for capital investment in community infrastructure. Uh, this includes social infrastructure, in, which includes the MUSH uh, group, which is municipal infrastructure, um, uh, utilities and higher, uh, I'm sorry, uh, universities and higher education, uh, schools, and then the healthcare uh, industry. Uh, additionally, in investing in the cleanup of coal facilities, including both at power plants 
uh, and at mines is emphasized. Uh, the cleanup work can create some really good paying jobs for impacted workers, specifically coal miners, uh, for several years beyond coal mine closures. And it, it can, has the potential to expand outdoor recreation uh, potential. Um, the cleanup and reuse of some coal power plants may also benefit communities through some potential creation of workspaces or recreation spaces uh, or other business opportunities within uh, a, an adaptive reuse or, or, or reuse of the facilities. Um, and fifth, the committee recommends several financial strategies in the draft plan. Uh, these are going to include uh, creating a, a statewide uh, investment entity that acts as a vehicle for private capital to invest directly into transition communities. Um, the members of the committee noted that both public and private capital is critical to transition communities in order for them to improve infrastructure uh, and to invest in economic development. Uh, the committee will also recommend policy that carves out capital dedicated specifically to uh, transition communities. Federal and state dollars will be advocated for uh, and utilization of, of entities like green banks and other high risk investment funds uh, in transition efforts will be highlighted. Uh, and finally, the group will recommend a review and updates to some state tax policy, including how renewable generation uh, is assessed uh, and how uh, statewide distribution of taxes uh, can actually occur. Um, so some, some key takeaways from Colorado's plan that I just wanted to emphasize, I think that are important for Wyoming. Um, is the importance of setting a, a setting and following an agreed upon timeline for closure of, of coal facilities. You know, this allows transition programs to be developed and deployed strategically, uh, providing a maximum utility at a minimum cost during the transition timeline. Um, we felt like this recommendation, recommendation, and we heard it from workers in coal communities, was, was vital for coal workers as well, so that they can make their own plans. Um, second, dedicating long-term resources to create and sustain local rural development hubs. Allowing them to drive their own transitions and economic development is really critical. Hubs are empowered uh, to make bold community-wide decisions. They have a broad ability to address um, uh, wide-ranging community issues and serve as liaisons between private industry and public agencies. A third, investing in long-term economic development with a deliberate focus on economic diversification is paramount for tr transitions, as you've heard earlier today. Uh, adopting a model that starts by growing revenue uh, and jobs from already established businesses and communities first has the greatest probability for success. Working together as a region to support and attract new industry, uh, while more complicated, uh, will highlight a significantly broader ability of a region to meet the needs of industry, not just the abilities of a single town. Um, and supporting creative exploration of new business opportunities through business incubation and entrepreneurship um, must be a priority for transition communities. Uh, fourth, deciding now to focus on high road sustaining, uh, sustainable family uh, sustaining jobs is the only way to re retain and attract uh, highly skilled workers needed by industry. It's all too easy for communities to attract low wage, low skilled jobs to town. However, those, way, those, uh, uh, those jobs don't necessarily improve the net economic impact of the community. Um, demanding workforce standards, local hire, and Davis-Bacon equivalent wages on any and all public works projects is also important. Uh, fifth, uh, working to identify supports for impacted workers from wage and health benefit def differentials to retraining uh, is, re is, is key to re retaining a community's workforce and, and its identity. Um, and finally, prioritizing investment in critical community infrastructure, uh, including the MUSH infrastructure, uh, in municipal infrastructure, utilities, uh, I mean, universities and colleges, schools, uh, and healthcare is necessary to allow any a community to transition and to support new industry. Uh, so the role of the Blue Green Alliance uh, to wrap up here uh, will continue in, in Colorado's process, uh, advising and assisting partners in, in final drafting of that, of the statewide plan, 
Uh, we'll also look to engage uh, in development and support for uh, upcoming legislation in the state um, that will execute the committee's, uh, the committee's policy uh, recommendations. Um, we'll also be engaging with communities through the transition process, assisting with development of standards or policies that create and, create and sustain high road jobs, uh, achieve some environmental gain, and then, or advance in innovation through research and development. Um, and we'll also be sharing the lessons learned from Colorado's process and other states' processes and advocating for a larger federal role in supporting uh, local transition communities. Um, so with that, uh, we'll move on uh, to Q&A. Thank you, Chris. We appreciate those good comments very much. Um, we do have some questions that I know uh, folks are anxious to get answered. So I'll, I'll ask the question and then we'll see if we have any, any brave volunteer to answer the question. So uh, question one is, COVID has given Wyoming the opportunity to receive millions of dollars in federal funds. How might the state spend this money in a way that helps us economically for the long run to maintain and improve um, our, our workforce, to diversify our workforce? Dale, I can answer that. Um, I think I talked a little bit about this. You know, investing in key, key uh, community infrastructure is a, a great strategy, especially you know laying the base for additional business and op business opportunity in communities. And I think another recommendation would really be to uh, help empower local communities um, by investing in a long-term uh, staff supports for. Uh, what I said is, you know, a rural development hub uh, or a model where folks can focus on long-term planning and economic development work. Those would be my recommendations. Okay, we'll move to the next question. And it is, diversi diversifying Wyoming's agricultural sector could include community-supported agriculture, entrepreneurial ag, and home-based business. Wyoming has approved hemp cultivation and and processing, um, what do you think is applicable from the Colorado uh, cannabis industry and what can we learn uh, from what you've done there? Um, so this is, again on this. this is my mine, I think, you know what, so in my, my work, I was, I served as the economic development director for Pueblo County uh, for several years. And one of the things that we did when uh, cannabis was legalized in, in Colorado is we looked at uh, ways to make uh, farming uh, profitable again. And it was a means to protect the water rights of, uh, of the farms uh, in Southern Colorado primarily. Um, and the way that we've envisioned doing that was by uh, allowing farmers to grow crops that had a, a, an elevated market value um, so that the, the, the profit from uh, in farming was actually uh, doable. I think the same happens with hemp. Uh, and in Wyoming, you know, it's a it's a uh, a, a crop that just generates more uh, dollars per acre uh, and allows the ag industry as an industry sector uh, to be more sustainable um, and more di diversified and and more resilient from uh, effects upon individual crops. Very good, thank you for that. Um, kind of going a little along that. Uh, same same uh, line of thought. Um, there, there's a notion that uh, Wyoming coal will be the the last standing, and there are a lot of state level e efforts in standing in the way of, of transitions. And so, what I want you to address is how do communities plan for the future of that. But I'd also like for you to think about that in the context of in these ag and energy communities. Uh, you know, there's there, there's a fear that keeps that drives this thinking, right? Afraid of losing culture, uh, afraid of losing their children that they move off uh, somewhere else, afraid of of uh, losing that su sustainable living, but also a fear of new things like you just mentioned, uh, and cannabis or the hemp industry and in, in, in Wyoming, a fear of what that might look like for them. And so I'd like you to address, um, maybe all three of you would have comments on this one, but how we transition from that last standing 
uh, mindset and this is how we've done it this is what we know and this is what we're comfortable with who would who would like to go first on that one big question i know <laughs> uh i'll start and just to reiterate a few of the things about you know there's a there's often a big fear that uh if you speak what you think is happening in the future then that will precipitate it or that will be the cause of it as opposed to twisting that mindset and saying that we can see this rationally we can see it in the market we can see it in the projections um we you know can respect the approach of the government but from a local standpoint we're going to need to do something and so i think that that um, acknowledging that those kinds of fears are out there and that this attitude can be uh, detrimental to moving forward, I think is a great start. And of course, that's easier said than done. And that's the importance of leadership is somebody to say, it doesn't mean we think coal is bad or we think that we're trying to make it go. We're saying that the prudent thing to do is to, is to read these tea leaves accurately, regardless of how you feel about anything else. Just like you might say, this dam is not is not stable. It's going to crash one day. We should do something about this, regardless of whether you like the person who owns it or whether it's done or any of those kinds of things. If you fished on it, point being, if it you know accepting reality, I think is the is the very first step. And once that happens, then people don't need to be afraid, and then they can they can charge forward, and still you know and still support what they have with respect to the fossil fuel industry if they'd like to go that route. I, I might, uh, thank you, Cindy. And Dale, I might comment in response to your question, which is a big one. Um, and it gets to, you know, what I call the nature of the rupture and how leadership responds to it that, that Cindy flagged. The challenge with economic development is it's a long-term enterprise that rewards those who begin working and planning and developing strategies early. And yet our political cycles and news cycles, uh, in some cases our industry interests are shorter term in duration. And so it's a balancing act of creating or you know, looking for and supporting leaders that are willing to take risks on convening a longer term conversation. I would say actually that's why coal is the easiest industry to work with because its demise is so clear, even though it's on different timelines in different places. Oil and gas is much more challenging because of its episodic boom and bust cycles where you, one could legitimately say uh, we're in a demand slump or we have new competition from fill in the blank. We have new technologies that have created fill in the blank um, and the markets come up and down. And, and so people legitimately say, you know, it's going to come back. We're not going to actually realistically talk about and invest in alternative approaches to sustaining communities and business. Coal is I think clearest for us around an end game and that should, it, 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 but it's still there. It's difficult because in Wyoming in particular, because coal is so important and particularly from a revenue standpoint, but obviously also economically that it can be thought of as a third rail issue. You're either with us or against us. And I would just submit that that thinking doesn't serve Wyoming and Wyoming communities as well as perhaps industry. Uh, and so, how you move beyond that sort of third rail challenge is a function of leadership and civic space and people willing to have difficult conversations respectfully. But the flip side is knowing that there's an end game that uh, we can't continue to do business as usual. This is an advantage of a crisis. This is a rupture gives us focus and clarity. Wyoming has you know, obviously short term budget shortfalls, but it also has massive savings that it can redeploy. Uh, around the first question that you flagged, Dale, around how you might invest in building new competitive advantages, either you know thinking about it from a statewide standpoint, from a workforce development standpoint, from an infrastructure standpoint, from a rural hub or you know business incubator and scaling standpoint. I mean, you could take any number of approaches there, but you won't know what the right approach is until you have the conversation at the state level and you begin to listen to people in the communities around the state of Wyoming. And I, I think that's been missing. And I, I know there's been a, obviously there's been an endow effort under Governor Meade, and there has been a, there is a power Wyoming effort currently. Those efforts need a little juice. They, they, uh, you know, they need some real resources. They need some higher visibility. And I think that they could potentially be very productive. Yeah, just to add on, on Sydney and Ben's comments, uh, I couldn't agree more. 
Um, but I, I just wanted to say that, you know, it's kind of rare. It's very rare in uh, today where we have some advance notice of an impending closure. Those things don't come along. I remember vividly when the, the steel industry bottomed out in the 80s, and that was uh, unforeseen and was economically devastating uh, to Southern Colorado where a steel plant exists. So taking advantage of having that advance notice now and being proactive now to do economic diversification work, which Cindy noted is a 10 year process. Uh, ben that said the same, it's a long time. Uh, investing in that now while you have the, the opportunity and giving uh, you know advance um, a chance for communities to economically diversify, I think is the opportunity here. Um, and while the eyes of legislators uh, and this, at the federal level as well as the state levels are thinking about these things, it's an opportunity uh, to do something now. Let me ask a follow-up for, for you guys for that. But, you know, uh, most of my family lives around um, energy and agricultural communities, and it's it's fine that we sit on panels and we talk about you know the we need strong leadership at at a state level or federal level and you know we can see that coal is transitioning we know know that's a reality but but i would argue that really reality is about what individuals feel and so so how do we give individuals confidence that there is a future out there for them because if they look historically at you know a lot of the communities that were on, on the map that you put up chris or we look at Coal Strip, Montana, or you know, you look at my hometown of Woodward, Oklahoma. Um, what they saw during the energy boom was certainly a what they most individuals considered a better place, where their kids were staying in the community, um, there were jobs for them. How, how do we provide a sense of comfort and confidence uh, to these folks so that they are actually um, facilitating and helping with uh, with the transition? transition it would seem to me that those that local support is the key to building any kind of leadership at the state or federal federal level uh, i can and jump in on that um you know I, i'm a firm believer that uh america is what it is today uh because of, of innovation and entrepreneurialism and that entrepreneurial spirit um i think that we've lost that in a lot of ways and it's time to bring it back and that uh, in an economic diversification strategy uh, and economic development strategies and execution of those, entrepreneurialism needs to have a big role. Um, and allowing uh, Wyoming citizens, uh, impacted coal workers, to uh, and supporting them to, to uh, take their uh, brilliant idea, idea that they have and actually bring it to market uh, is something that's going to provide that level of security uh, uh, to communities and, and to the state. Um, but I think fostering that is an intentional effort. Uh, and that is something that we really need to, to emphasize. Um, and doing it now before really hard times come uh, when the coal industry is completely gone um, is important. That's a, that's a great measure to think about now. You know, and I would I would add the other side of the coin to that that the entrepreneurial self development and and um, uh, developing your idea is really really important. I think the other half of that is to have very aggressive um, identification of where the living wage jobs are, and as Chris says, focus more on the quality versus the quantity, and then what's the gap you have between what you're doing now and what you could do there in your own community or elsewhere and then to provide that kind of training for those who want it because not everybody wants to move not everybody wants to change it's difficult when you get you know advanced in your career and you want to then have to switch gears but the i think that one thing that uh, local communities can do and the community college network in, in particular can do is to create those or identify those growing sectors and places where and provide the the um, training to fill that gap and there's some tools that are that are fairly specific to the midwest but uh, that have been developed by ohio university and one of that is the skills identifier 
and uh, where those skills um, can be transferred to other kinds of uses. But I think it's going to take a more sophisticated approach to where the jobs are and what is uh, what is a living wage job and how can you get there from here. All right, I'd, I'd love to add on to what Chris and Cindy said um, and maybe state the obvious first, which is that showing up and being honest and genuine is the first step to working with people to solve problems and to build a better future. I think there's a lot of disingenuousness out there, uh, people telling people what they want to hear as opposed to what's really happening and what really might happen and who they might work with and to what end. It's just foundational. We need more of that. Secondly, I think the comments that Chris and Cindy, I think, have emphasized this is that building partnerships you know, within the community and then outside the community, thinking both the internal capacities and strengths and networks and then external capacity strengths and networks. I think that's one of the success stories from the North Fork in Colorado after the closures of the mines in 2013 and 16 was that right away they had Region 10 Economic Development, Regional Economic Development Authority, they had EDA, they had the governor's office, they had the State Department of you know, Economic Development. They, they, they convened a conversation very quickly to solve problems and bring, bring resources and were able to, you know, they had different politics and people in that valley, up valley, down valley, and they didn't work it all out, but they worked out enough where they came up with a strategy and they started to work together and they brought resources, financial, training, technical, and human. I would say too that it's important for people, given the long-term nature of economic development, redevelopment, to appreciate the value of momentum. Short-term successes are hugely helpful. Look for them, celebrate them, communicate them, build on them as you work for that longer game, longer game success. Um, I, I just think that we all need that psychologically. You know, it may not be every week, it may not be every month, but every quarter we gotta have something to point to. That's the result of our action and our efforts and the risks we're taking to rethink the future. And then lastly, on the skills point that, that I think Cindy and Chris both spoke to, you know, the first response in an energy-focused community downturn is how quickly am I going to leave? And this has been Wyoming's story for a long time. It's been the story of particular communities. One of the interesting places is Northwest New Mexico, where the Navajo community, which has been deeply involved in coal mining and coal-fired power plants, has they, they don't leave. And so they ask a different set of questions around what the next steps are. So part of the conversation is if you weren't going to leave, what would it take for you to stay? And if you were to stay, how could we productively engage you in building the future? And what is the future that you want at this point? So that knowing that mobility is a sort of one of the challenges for dealing with energy transitions or economic transitions and energy communities, that addressing that mobility issue up front. And it, the mobility has a skills dimension, I think, that's really powerful. Not only do we have the wage cliff stepping off a, you know, really high paying energy job into a, let's just say you know for caricature's sake a low paying service job that's seasonal and part-time and doesn't have any health insurance that's not a very attractive proposition as we all can agree but are we even in our high road commitment are we training for people the jobs that really exist there's a lot of frustration that people are trained for jobs and then they're not in their community where they don't even exist so I think we need to do a better job with our job retraining programs where we're thinking about what the skills are that are necessary to compete in growing sectors of the economy and occupations that we that at least have a good sense that are growing or might fit in the place where we are. Uh, San Juan Community College, Cindy's absolutely right, the community college infrastructure is critical to so many aspects of these transition efforts. San Juan Community College in Farmington is doing a really nice job around its workforce development activities. One of the things that I learned from them is this idea of stacked credentials. So, you know, if you're making $100,000 a year, your debt load probably and your cost of living probably reflects that income level. So right away, you ask someone to stay in the community, but to cut their pay in half just for discussion purposes. You have to show them a pathway where they can continue to sustain income and build skills that will allow them to grow their income level. So the stack credential concept, and I think this is fairly more, getting more and more common, you're into and out of an educational or retraining context and back into the labor market. 
you have identified a career ladder that isn't just one skill short term, three, six months, and then you're thrown to the wolves. I think the evidence is pretty clear that doesn't work that well. So this idea of sustained training opportunities with vocational internships uh, or you know on the job work experience um, in a career ladder context is really worth thinking more about. Yeah, I think what? just to, to say one more thing on that, Ben, um, that we haven't said yet is the word apprenticeships. Um, you know, apprenticeships paid on the job training uh, that is often affiliated with many of the labor organizations that are in coal communities uh, are tremendous opportunities for the education, for re-education and for building career pathways for individuals. So, so let's uh, training discussion just a little bit further. This is actually a question that was sent to Cindy and we'll let her uh, start with it. But I, I think that uh, as we look around Wyoming or anywhere in this country for that matter right now, delivering workforce training on a varied enough scale uh, to be meaningful is, is difficult. Right. And, you know, co-workers are no different. They're not a monolith. They're all going to have different interests, different skills behind the scenes. As you said, a couple of you have mentioned community colleges. Um, certainly community colleges generally focus on a handful of, of, um, of, of training that they do. And it's usually different around the state. Uh, so what are your some of your thoughts about how to develop that diversified workforce training opportunities in some of these communities that are fairly remote and, and have limited educational resources. Cindy, mm -hmm. would you start with that? Sure, I'll, uh, I'll start with uh, one end of the spectrum and uh, in Southeast Montana with the um, Crow and Northern Cheyenne tribes who uh, both have um, members who've worked at the Rosebud Mine and at the Coal Strip plant. And the prospect of losing a large percentage of their employment base has been a big issue. And so the tribal colleges, Little Bighorn College and Chief um, Dullknife have been working on a potential program that would uh, provide very specific skill building that leads to an apprenticeship as Chris mentioned, which is really important. The, and, and that these would be open to not only the public, but to all tribal members so that, and, and then you know ultimately, and this is not coming to fruition this year, but ultimately there would be transportation between the two schools and potentially between a training center and coal strip so that people could take advantage of each of these opportunities before they had to leave town, go to Billings or go somewhere else to enter an apprenticeship program. In addition to that, and, and this is the example that's that's going on in southeast Montana, but I'll give you another example that's going on in Appalachia, and that's the Coalfield Development Corporation. And they deal with uh, strictly minors who are out of work. And they have a they have uh, five social enterprises that teach skills that are needed in the local communities. Because as we know, some places um, the Bach and a bunch of places, people get up and leave. There's not a job, I'll move. Um, other places people say there's not a job, I'll stay. And so this kind of workforce development has uh, identified what kinds of skills are needed in the community. So uh, uh, a pretty big gap though, that they, they are on a wage cliff when they do this kind of thing, but they'll be developing a skill that can also lead into an apprenticeship. Sometimes maybe it's carpentry, some of it's welding, um, and, but it also includes a wraparound program that talks about uh, financial health and social health. And so people get learn other kinds of skills while they're also learning workforce development kinds of skills that will take them into the marketplace. But skills that will help put them on a career path um, that they might not have had that kind of exposure in the jobs that they had. Uh, so that's a, that's a second form of workforce uh, development. The other thing is I would, uh, you know, and I'd like to echo Ben again, so important to be authentic and truthful about what's available out there and um, and what is a living wage and where are those jobs. And so whatever is promoted in terms of a community college program or an apprenticeship or anything else, 
I think it needs to come with a statement that it takes this amount of time, here's the funding to do it, you're likely to have to move, here's the skills to learn, but so that people know going into it, because there's part of this, the reason that a lot of these programs don't work or fail is because their success rate for the students is low. And then people say, well, why would we want to put money toward that? Who needs that effort? That's not, you know, it's not working. Well, people need to know what they're getting into and to be able to be the right match to make that kind of commitment. So I think that's really important. And I've got a lot of other thoughts, but I'm going to stop there and let Chris and Ben jump in here. Chris, if you're pausing, so I'll make a comment. I think this general area to you know build on what Cindy said, Dale, is, is woefully underfunded. Um, it's one of the reasons that people are so demoralized by their experience. It's short term. It's not professionally housed in many cases. The level of instruction isn't what it should be. And then there's just the strategy around training people for what, you know, uh, that has to be very thoughtful. So, I, I, you know, this is something that Wyoming could really step up on the commitment to its citizens around workforce reskilling and retraining um, either through the community college infrastructure or not. I mean, right now across the country, university, technical colleges, community colleges, vocational training centers are on the chopping block. Their budgets are shrinking by double digit percentages. And some of the first programs to get cut are vocational type programs that are not core four year offerings. And this is the wrong time to take that view. Um, so we need to, we need obviously to, to double down on the funding for it. We need to ensure that the quality is there and the consistency. And I, I just think this idea, and I'll just be repetitive because I, I believe in it enough. You need an opportunity to learn and practice and learn and practice and learn and practice. This is not a one-off thing. And we need to be comfortable with the idea, like Cindy said, that we might work with an individual, a family, a class of individuals, a community, and they might choose to take those skills elsewhere. This is a democracy. We can do that. And that, I mean, that's what I was chatting with Lorenzo Reyes, who runs the Workforce Development Center at San Juan College, and he said, I've made my peace with that. I'm helping people along the way. A lot of these people, if they can stay and find productive employment, fantastic. That'll improve our community. But more broadly, we're improving our country. We're helping people succeed. Um, and I think we have to take that view. It's a kind of a movement generous view. Um, and I think it'll benefit Wyoming if if, if leadership could, could embrace that. You know, Ben, in, in your presentation, you showed this slide early on of these uh, economic development threads that sort of interconnected and had a variety of things going on there. Uh, it's a br brilliant slide. And I, I think it needs to be stated that economic development uh, is about intentionality. Mm -hmm. uh, first, understanding you know, what the market potential is uh, for your community. What differentiates your community from every other community in the country? And what is your competitive advantage? How can you leverage your intrinsic natural resources uh, to do something uh, that generates revenues and, and hire employees. Um, that's a, an important component of what uh, an economic development agency or, or group would need to, to, to know to start from. Uh, what kinds of businesses that are already in your community that pose the greatest potential for expansion, for business expansion? That is the 85% of all new jobs are created by existing local established businesses. That is a probability. Uh, of moving forward is great in, in that regard. And then uh, aligning the needs of your existing businesses, uh, aligning the needs of prospective industry in the community and what that workforce demand will be with the education program that's mm -hmm. offered through apprenticeships uh, or community colleges or, your, or universities is critical. And we heard loud and clear in Craig that the community college uh, basically just asks its residents uh, who can teach such and such a class. Mm -hmm. And generally, they don't have the kinds of uh, folks that are able to teach the kinds of skills that are needed by the marketplace uh, and, and industry and, and, and business moving forward. Um, uh, so, you know, how do you align those? Economic development plays a critical role in aligning those things and then bringing resources to the community that allow you to hire the right professor, the right teacher, whoever's going to do that task, uh, hire the right and bring the right apprenticeship program forward that's going to meet the market demand. That alignment 
is fundamental uh, for success. Without that, you're just kind of shooting in the dark. So um, we're going we're, we're gonna to give you a chance to be the advisors to the governor and the legislature, looking at what's going on in Wyoming, knowing um, that our, our budget is under extreme duress because of um, the reductions in uh, the exact topic we're talking about, coal and, and the energy sector. And he called you in and said, hey, give, it, give me your best advice for a path forward of how we can take maybe the first step to deal with this problem. What would your advice be to the governor and the legislature seeking that advice? Cindy's got the whole process mapped out. Her slide was so good. Uh, but I'd love to make a run at this because I just co-authored an op-ed with Rob Godby that we've submitted to a Wyoming newspaper that I hope will run next week. Uh, envisioning this very question, Dale. And so I've been thinking about it. And you remember I said economic development is a process and an outcome? I think this is a moment to focus on process. And before we ask people, before the governor asks people, before the legislature asks people, who make tough choices about trade-offs and the budget, infrastructure spending, social services, and the rest of it, there needs to be a conversation about what is important to Wyoming at the community level that gets rolled up to the state level around what does it mean to be Wyoming? What's great about Wyoming? What do we want our children to inherit? And let that guide the discussion about how to reallocate resources, retool the revenue model, which cannot get us there right now, and begin to think about placing investments and building existing infrastructure such as the Wyoming Business Council, which is an outstanding enterprise, um, to address a wider set of transition challenges in the communities across the state. That's how I would start, Dale. So, Ben, I agree with all of that. I would definitely start with the community-driven process and make sure that when that's rolled up to the state level that it doesn't get skewed to <laughs> one, one bucket of things that this is going to be our future. Not that innovation, carbon innovation, and all those other things aren't important, but uh, if you know if it's not locally driven, if people can't buy it, then it's not it's not going to be successful. So I don't live um, in Wyoming, so I'll say that I'll say it out loud. <laughs> I think the revenue model has um, some opportunity for some additional income from income tax. Um, and I know that's really unpopular in Wyoming, but if you look around the country, you know, we see, and I did a short analysis of this, of uh, how revenue is generated in other kinds of, in other states and the amount of responsibility, financial responsibility that individuals bear in different ways, whether it's property tax or income tax or transfers of funds or leveraging federal money or all those other kinds of things. And I think there's some opportunities in um, Wyoming that would be just tiny compared to the revenue that comes from coal but by maximizing some of those kinds of things, it, I think it equalizes the approaches that the states are taking so that uh, if and when there is a national economic transition platform, which I hope there, well, and there is one, we just put it out, um, but I hope that it's, it's actually affected, um, that there's some parity so that Wyoming can also uh, achieve some of the financial assistance that's out there by by already um, building some of the revenues that they're able they're able to do independently. Someday that's we will my have plug to... for the National Economic Transition Plan for and from JTF. Someday we'll have to have a discussion on how our tax policy at all levels feeds in into this whole problem and sets up sets up our economy and so we get what we plan for sometimes and we. Certainly, that's a good discussion too, Chris. Um, any, what's your, what's your advice to that leadership? You know, I, I would advise uh, legislators uh, to be bold. Uh, simply that uh, it, it, the time is now to not uh, just be in, in full denial uh, that the coal is is coming to an end. I think the time is now to recognize that and to uh, really start planning and deliberately working proactively to address 
uh, that 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 the industry change that's coming. Um, I think that's important. And I think as legislators as well, uh, amplify your voices to Washington, D.C. Uh, I think that federal resources uh, will be helpful uh, and you know, bringing them and, and highlighting the economic uh, and the human issues in Wyoming uh, com coal communities will be really important. Uh, and, and making sure that the federal delegation really knows that uh, that plight and the importance of a federal investment in a just transition program nationwide is critical, not just for Wyoming, for, but for many other states. Um, I think that's, the, and, and making sure that when that uh, funding materializes at some point, um, and if there are any other funding sources that materialize, that the state might create, you know, think creatively in severance taxes or other types of things. But the emphasis is, is giving that those money and resources directly to local communities. Uh, who have a transition plan, who have an economic development plan, but simply haven't been able to get that work done. Uh, like Cindy said, uh, like I said, my presentation local um, is really important and having the communities have the ability to execute their own plans uh, is is really key. And that's what I think those res the, the, the federal resources and, and state resources should go toward. So our time is, is drawing short. Um, but thank all of you for such a wonderful conversation and you've brought your expertise to the table. We do want to give each of you an opportunity to offer us some uh, closing thoughts be, uh, before Monica comes back on and brings a little organization to the back to the discussion. So um, uh, Cindy, would you like to kick that off just to share any last thoughts that um, you, you might have for the group today? Well, I think your last question, Dale, was a, a perfect segue into uh, the uh, Just Transition Fund has just produced just recently last week, the uh, National Economic um, Trans uh, Transition Platform that um, we've seen now picked up a little bit in some of the political circles. Uh, but we hope that this is uh, it's been developed from a, a task force of around the country with all different kinds of uh, experiences and inputs. And we hope that this is the basis for a national transition office or some other um, kind of vehicle um, that will help do these kinds of things to put some uh, better planning structures, some locally driven initiatives and some funding into communities to achieve the, the pillars of the uh, platform. And then finally, I would just like to put in a little plug that the Just Transition Fund is having a webinar on um, August 6th, which is really the, an introduction to the kinds of services that we have that can be available to communities in Wyoming. Um, and so, you know, I talked a little bit about funding and grant writing and impact studies and facilitation and those kinds of things. Um, but we think that there, there's a place for some of that. So I'd like to offer that also. And I'll let the, the higher level academic and labor thinking uh, finish out with Chris and Ben. So thanks very much. This has been a great experience. Thank you so much, Cindy. So uh, Ben, do you want to offer your, uh, your thoughts in closing? Thanks, Dale. Yeah, I just a um, couple quick final thoughts. Uh, and I love the last question that you, that you threw out there. I thought that was also a great concluding question. Um, I want to comment on this topic of mitigation versus, you know, investing in mitigation versus investing in new competitiveness. It's something that I think both the Blue Green Alliance and Just Transitions Fund have wrestled with in their own ways. It's something I wrestle with. It's something I generally see that uh, take the new, the new Mexico Energy Transition Act, which heavily impacted Northwest New Mexico. It pretty much put all of its eggs. It's, you know, it's, transition monies into mitigation, a very little bit of it into workforce retraining. And I think that that's okay, but it's not adequate. That we need to do a better job of balancing sh mitigating short-term impacts of economic ruptures with investing in new competitiveness. If all we do is mitigate, I guarantee you the people will have to leave that place anyway. 
if all we do is invest in competitiveness, those people will leave before we can give them that opportunity. So I, my plea is just to think about those, hold those two in your minds, mitigate impacts while investing and in creating new competitive opportunities. I think that we often find ourselves thinking about one or the other, but balancing those will be really constructive. Secondly, you know, when I, when I did this research last year, I really didn't know the answer to the question of whether communities could successfully diversify after a major natural resource industry downturn or what that looked like. And the good news is that we see a lot of examples of places turning a new leaf over and finding uh, different industry mixes, repositioning their labor force businesses and community, uh, particularly for location neutral opportunities when you live in the Intermountain West with our incredible natural values and landscapes and access to the outdoors. But the evidence is clear, diversification is possible. And I think it was Chris who said, it's, it's not going to be one major industry that replaces one major industry. It's actually going to look quite different. Be prepared for that. And there is going to be a, a decline in wages before the wages start to come back up. And that's going to be part of the process. So setting some expectations around that are going to be really helpful. And it's hard work. Some of the diversification that we see around the West is simply a function of the rest of the economy is withered away and that's what's left. I call that diversification by default. And that is not the future we want for Wyoming. We want a dynamic, innovative, energized diversification that really looks to the youth and mid-career people and giving them new opportunities. And that is focused, as Chris said, and Cindy too, on innovation and opportunity and working together. So, I mean, those are, those are my final thoughts, Dale. I'm actually quite optimistic about what we can do if we choose to do it. Thank you so much, Ben. Chris? Well said, uh, both Ben and Cindy, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I think just a, a, a kind of a final thought would be, it's important for us to put ourselves uh, in the shoes of workers and talk to workers and understand the issues that they're, they're going to be grappling with. Um, and an example of that, to Ben's point, in terms of you know, a social support to get them from where they are now to where they want to be soon uh, really needs to have a couple of pieces to it. It needs to have both security and allowing the, the worker to uh, move from one career field path to another career path um, uh, with, you know, the same wage that they're earning right now uh, so that they're not losing ground. Um, but then also to recognize that it's going to take some time for them to get from point A to point B and giving them that, that, that net in between. And I like to think of if I'm a, a coal miner and I would like to start a, a small business, um, I'm going to need some training. I'm going to need some time. I'm going to need some help. And in, that, the, in the interim period, when I have that small business starting, uh, I know I'm not going to be profitable and I'm going to need to have some help in making my wage uh, livable. Um, and then I need to move forward and, and, uh, allow a, 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 a my business to expand into new markets um, takes concentrated effort. And I think focusing on workers first, uh, laying out standards for labor and, and for workforce standards for uh, various projects and making sure that the high road investment is the top priority uh, high, in high road jobs is uh, the best strategy. Thank you very much, Chris. It was an honor to uh visit with you, uh, all three of you today, and I, and I appreciate your patience very much as I work through those questions. And now I'd like to turn it back over to um, um, Monica for some closing comments. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dale. Thank you so much, um, panelists and participants. Um, these are hard conversations and I know my wheels are spinning and thinking about um, how we can identify our current community assets, how we can grassroots organize and how we can have these hard conversations and bring um, solutions to the table. So I just really appreciate everyone being here um, and it's really important. So uh, this is the end of the webinar series and we hope that there's more of these discussions to come. Um, 
for folks that registered, uh, you'll get a recording uh, to your email. You can also watch this whole series on YouTube at the Powder River Basin Resource Council YouTube, or uh, check out our website and that'll get you there too. That's powderriverbasin.org. Thank you again so much, everyone. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care.